title of today's message, Whose Earth Is It Anyway? Earth Day 2022 was Friday, April 22nd. Working for an environmental justice organization, Faith in Place, for just seven months, I've learned so much. A whole new appreciation for environmental justice and all it offers for ministry and community regarding care of all of creation. I spent Friday planting an Ohio Buckeye tree at Covenant United Church of Christ, which I helped to obtain for the church through the Chicago Region Tree Initiative at the request of a field ed student from McCormick who's serving at Covenant, Minister Douglas Gaines. It was a beautiful Earth Day tree planting ceremony. I spent the remainder of the day into, into the, well into the evening at Garrett Theological, Evangelical, excuse me, Theological Seminary for the launch of the new Center of Ecological Regeneration and the installation of its first director, Dr. Reverend Dr. Tim Eberhardt. A glorious celebration. Theological education is once again advancing to equip clergy to lead the church into the next generation of Christendom. And hopefully, so follows the church. You know, in seminary, we often talk about the lag in time it takes for the church to catch up with the advances in theological education. Many clergy feel they can't teach nor preach what they learn in seminary in church. That it's often too radical and that the church is not ready. Too many clergy have, theolog have leave theological education and return to the church only to maintain status quo. They teach what is comfortable and acceptable to those who sign their check and they try not to shake the boat too much. Amen. Well, if you haven't figured it out yet, that is not your pastors. <laughs> We're committed to preaching and teaching the truth. Jesus said it is the truth that will set us free and that's the only way things will change. And today's truth, Al Gore called it an inconvenient truth, is that we collectively as human beings have done a poor job caring for creation, yes. the earth and its inhabitants. As Dr. Eberhardt of Garrett's new Center for Ecological Regeneration said in his message on Friday, it's like God looking at Cain after he killed Abel and saying, what? have you done? We can do better. We must do better. Please know that where I'm, that's where I'm headed, encouragement to do better. But before we can get to the encouragement to do better, we really have to grapple with what we collectively have done starting with what we have done to the earth. What have we done? Our way of life pollutes the earth and its inhabitants in toxic, dangerous ways. Agricultural processes and pro products, industrial production, multiple forms of transportation and the burning of fossil fuels, waste dumping and other forms of pollution contaminate the air, the water, the soil, leading to the poor quality and quantity of natural resources 
illness, disease, and all living creatures, as well as an irreversible damage to the earth and inhabitants, and ultimately, it's causing climate change. To quote the encyclical letter, Laudato C si of Pope Francis on care of our common home, each year, hundreds of millions of tons, excuse me, hundreds of millions, I said that right, of tons of waste, are generated, much of it is non-biodegradable, highly toxic and radioactive from homes and businesses, from construction and demolition sites, from clinical, electronical, electronic, excuse me, and industrial sources. The earth, our home, is beginning to look more and more like an immense pile of filth. Sounds like Pope Francis is a prophet as well. In many parts of the planet, he goes on to say, the elderly lament that once beautiful landscapes are now covered with rubbish. Our children also lament. Industrial waste, he continues, and chemical products utilized in cities and agricultural areas can lead to bioaccumulation in the organisms of the local population, even when levels of toxins in those places are low. Frequently, no measures are taken after people's health has been irreversibly affected. End of quote. And I'll add that even when people's health has been irreversibly affected, especially in black and brown communities, nothing is done about it. It is a fact that communities of color are disproportionately affected by both pollution and climate change. In cities across the U.S., communities of color are located near hazardous facilities due to redlining and economic disadvantage and discrimination. And as a result, black and brown people face serious health risks such as cancer, asthma, and other respiratory diseases. Well above that of white people. Black and brown children have as much as three times more asthma than white children. When we heard of the health disparities that led to more COVID deaths in black communities, those disparities are not simply because black people don't take care of ourselves. Many of the health disparities are environmental and are related to big business polluting the earth to maximize profits, literally on the health of black and brown and in some cases poor white people. My sermon title, Whose Earth Is It Anyway?, is the title of a writing by Dr. James Cone, father of black liberation theology, who was among the first to tie together what has been done to the earth with what has been done to members of the human family of the African diaspora. Dr. Cone states, racism is profoundly interrelated with the other evils, including degradation of the earth. Thank you, Dr. Cohn, for making the connection decades ago. And now I say it this way, that those who will exploit a people are the same who will exploit the earth. The psalmist says, the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. And the inconvenient truth is that there are those who have no problem exploiting all that God has created, both air, land, sea, animals, and humans. The biblical text today, thank you, Louise, for reading it and lifting up how wonderful it is and how much we enjoy this psalm. It's an interesting one for Earth Day. It almost seems that only the first verse relates to Earth Day. But let's take a closer look, and I encourage you to have it open in your bulletin as we walk through it. Like many psalms, Psalm 24 has several movements. I see at least three. They almost seem not to go together, but again, let's look closer, and let's start with the last move of the psalm, starting with verse 7. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? 
The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Some of you recognize this as a great anthem of the church. Anybody ever sang it as an anthem? The Psalms are set to music, and this is quite a popular anthem. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, sung as part of Handel's Messiah. Some of you know that I was married to a musician, and this is one of his favorite pieces to play. It's amazing how things come back. The church that, that I entered after I came back from U of I did the Messiah, and they, they did this song beautifully. And as I included it in the message, I'm like, Lord, you don't waste time anything. Its words offer a grand royal introduction of the king of glory, strong and mighty, mighty in battle. God is the king of glory. The anthem and the scripture demonstrate and command a reverence to a mighty God. Towards the end of the song, I believe from the Messiah, and I know at this church that I was at, at the end of the song, as, as the words end in this hymn, everyone would stand. Do you all do that? Everyone would stand and they would sing, all hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall, bring forth the royal diadem, and crown him Lord of all, tying Jesus to the king of glory in the Old Testament. The sopranos hit extremely high notes. The timpani and the percussions are vibrating. It's a wonderful hymn that leaves you feeling some sense of awe that we should feel when worshiping and acknowledging the almighty everlasting king of glory. So the psalm began seemingly to me very calm, like an educational turn, tone. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it. The world and those who live in it, for he has founded it on the seas and established it on the rivers. And it ends with lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. The king of glory at the end of the psalm is identified at the beginning of the psalm as the owner and creator of the earth and all that is in it. Don't miss this. This God, the Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle that humans have such reverence for, the whole place lifts up and the music fills the room. This same God, king of glory, is the creator and owner of all things noted at the beginning of the psalm. Whose earth is it anyway? The psalmist says that the earth is the Lord's, the very one who is strong and mighty, mighty in battle, the one that we have such reverence for, the one we worship and we say we adore during Advent, and the one we reverence. For he is the king of glory. So it begs the question, how can we have such reverence for this powerful God and pollute and destroy what belongs to God? How can we claim to have such reverence, all the music and, and everything that lifts up from this psalm towards the end, but do irreparable harm to that which the psalm tells us at the beginning he owns. How can we claim to have such reverence for God such that we commit one day a week at least to gathering to worship God, sing songs about God, give praise to God, and continue to do irreparable harm to that which belongs to God? And to bring Cone back into the conversation, not just the earth, but its inhabitants. For again, those who will exploit, humans will exploit the earth for the same gain and then worship God. How do we reconcile our treatment of God's creation with our reverence for God? 
And if that hasn't convicted us already, let's move into the next move of the psalm because it convicts us more directly. Hear the psalmist after declaring that the earth is the Lord's and all its inhabitants belong to God. The psalmist says, who then shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? Those who have clean hands and a pure heart. When it comes to our stewardship of the earth and care and love for all its inhabitants, few, if any of us, have clean hands. Just ask the other inhabitants of the earth. According to our world in data.org, at least 900 species have gone extinct in the last five centuries. And while extinction is part of the ecological process, the rapid loss of species we are seeing today is estimated by scientists to be between 1,000 and 10,000 times higher than the natural extinction rate. More than 35,000 species have been evaluated to be threatened with extinction today. In other words, our biodiversity and all its benefits are in jeopardy. According to the National Geographic, much of the Earth's biodiversity is in jeopardy due to human consumption and other activities that disturb and even destroy ecosystems. Pollution, climate change, and population growth are all threats to biodiversity. Some scientists estimate that half of all species on Earth will be wiped out within the next century. Our hands are not clean, they're quite dirty. The earth is groaning as a result and climate change is real. But thanks be to God for the sacred text, the solution I believe is in this same text when the writer says, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? He answers it, thank God. Those who have clean hands and pure hearts, the writer further clarifies that and says, who do not lift up their souls to what is false and do not swear deceitfully. The writer is calling for some truth telling. Seems to say, stop lying to yourselves and others making false claims when you know the truth. And I don't know about you, but when I read that, I hear the writer calling for some truth. In order to get these clean hands and pure hearts, we must face some inconvenient truths. So let's consume some more truth today. One way that those of us in environmental justice and social justice circles engage in truth telling is through land acknowledgments. We acknowledge the indigenous inhabitants of the land on which we reside, and in our case, worship. So I did a little digging and found a land acknowledgement from the University of Chicago, written by Symphony Fletcher of the Pritzker excuse me, School of Medicine. She's an MD candidate for 2024, and she wrote this land acknowledgement for the university as part of the 2021 Juneteenth reparations panel. She said, we inhabit, study, and work, and I'll add worship, in the land of the Peoria, Miami, Kikapu, and Potawatomi nations. These lands were the home of these native nations prior to their forced removal and relocation. These lands continue to be embedded with the rich histories and struggles for survival of each nation. She goes on to say, the University of Chicago does not exist independently from centuries of forced labor and economic extraction from enslaved African Americans. She says, in 1857, Stephen A. Douglas donated 10 acres of land valued today at approximately $1.2 million for the initial construction of the University of Chicago. Though most of history remembers Douglas for his political career, she says, the humans that he owned and amassed his fortune have a starkly different recollection. Confession, 
I'm sure you've heard it, is good for the soul, but first it's hard to do and it's hard to hear. But it is indeed good for the soul. The psalmist assures us that when we do not lift up our souls to what is false, in other words, when we embrace what is true, we're moving in the direction of those clean hands and pure heart. We're moving, as a matter of fact, the text says in verse 5, they will receive blessing from the Lord. And vindication from the Lord, the God of their salvation. Study it when you get home. We all need God's mercy, God's grace, and God's forgiveness. The text says, let's start embracing the truth. Jesus said, and the truth will set us free. There's more, more of a solution in verse 6. The psalmist continues and says, such is the company of those who seek him, who seek the face of God of Jacob. If I had more time, I'd deal with that God of the trickster Jacob. Where do we seek the face of God? The psalmist just told us that seeking the face of God is also something that we must do. What if we sought the face of God in our fellow human? There would be less exploitation, oppression, abuse, slavery, and pain. Maybe if we sought the face of God in creation, in the animals, and in the air, in the trees, and the plants, the flowers, and the sea, and the ocean, the lake, even from the dust from which we were formed. Maybe if we sought the face of God in creation, there would be less pollution. The psalmist says, such is the company of those who seek the face of God. Maybe if we sought the face of God within ourselves. Not that we ourselves are God's, but that we are made in God's image and so is our fellow human, maybe there'd be less degradation of one another and of the earth. If we sought the face of God in our neighbor and even in ourselves, this seems to be the hardest for us to accept and live with, that we are all made in God's image and likeness, all of us, and we have the lo this love and reverence for the king of glory the lord strong and mighty the lord mighty in battle but first john 4 asked the poignant question what if but what if we say we love god and do not love each other john says we are liars we cannot see god so how can we love god if we do not love the people we can see the commandment that God has given us, love God and love each other. Humans are always seeking more than what God has already provided, even within ourselves. If we knew we were enough, maybe we wouldn't exploit others. If we knew we were enough, Maybe we wouldn't have disdain for the other if we knew that we were enough. Maybe we wouldn't be afraid to see the God in each other. And in all of creation, it is the same God that loves us so that God gave us so much amazing landscape to begin with and amazing siblings with whom to live. And so I leave you with this before I take my seat. At Faith in Place, we celebrated an Earth Month vigil, and I was moved every once in a while. I try to do some creative writing, and I was moved to prepare this, and now I offer this to you. Do you realize how much you are loved? You are so loved that the birds serenade you daily with music more beautiful than Beethoven could ever pen. You are so loved that the sun shines brightly on you and nourishes your body with vitamin D as much as it warms your skin. You, you, and you are so loved 
that daily your life is blessed with the landscape of grass and trees, flowers and bees, earth and water, fruit to eat and to share from an abundance that the Creator provided with care. So you are charged to go, realizing how much you are loved by the earth. My final ask is that you simply love the earth and all of its inhabitants back. God bless you.